and Pace, Book Seven, Chapter Eleven. Read for LibriVox.org by Elena. Pelagaya Danilovna Melyukova, a broadly built, energetic woman, wearing spectacles, sat in the drawing room in a loose dress, surrounded by her daughters, whom she was trying to keep from feeling dull. They were quietly dropping melted wax into snow and looking at the shadows the wax figures would throw on the wall when they heard the steps and voices of the new arrivals in the vestibule. Hussars, ladies, witches, clowns and bears, after clearing their throats and wiping the hoar-frost from their faces in the vestibule, came into the ballroom where candles were hurriedly lighted. The clown, Dimler, and the lady, Nicholas, started to dance, surrounded by the screaming children and the mummers, covering their faces and disguising their voices, bowing to their hostess and arranged themselves about the room. Dear me, there's no recognising them, and Natasha! See whom she looks like. She really reminds me of somebody. But Herr Dimler, isn't he good? I don't know him, and how he dances. Dear me, there's a Circassian. Really, how becoming it is to dear Sonia. And who is that? Well, you have cheered us up. Nikita and Vanya, clear away the tables. And here we were, sitting so quietly. Ha, 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 the hussar, the hussar, just like a boy. And the legs, I can't look at him, different voices were saying. Natasha, the young Melyukov's favourite, disappeared with them into the back rooms, where a cork and various dressing gowns and male garments were called for and received from the footman by bare girlish arms from behind the door ten minutes later all the young melyukovs joined the mummers pelgaya danilovna having given orders to clear the rooms for the visitors and arranged about refreshments for the gentry and the serfs went about among the mummers without removing her spectacles peering into their faces with a suppressed smile and failing to recognize any of them it was not merely Dimler and the Rostovs she failed to recognize. She did not even recognize her own daughters or her late husband's dressing gowns and uniforms which they had put on. "'And who is this?' asked her governess, peering into the face of her own daughter dressed up like Kazan Tatar. "'I suppose it is one of the Rostovs. Well, Mr. Hussar, and what regiment do you serve in?' she asked Natasha. "'Here, hand some fruit jelly to the Turk,' she ordered the butler who was handing things around. "'That's not forbidden by his law.' Sometimes she looked at the strange but amusing capers cut by the dancers, who, having decided once for all that being disguised, no one would recognise them, were not at all shy. Pelagaya Danilovna hid her face with her handkerchief, and her whole stout body shook with irrepressible, kindly, elderly laughter. "'My little Sasha! Look at Sasha!' she said. After Russian country dances and chorus dances, Pelagaya Danilovna made the serves and gentry join in one large circle. A ring, a string, and a silver rouble were fetched, and they all played games together. In an hour all the costumes were crumpled and disordered. The corked eyebrows and moustaches were smeared over the perspiring, flushed, and merry faces. Pelagaya Danilovna began to recount the mummers, admired their cleverly contrived costumes, and particularly how they suited the young ladies, and she thanked them all for having entertained her so well. The visitors were invited to supper in the drawing-room, and the serfs had something served to them in the ballroom. "'Now to tell one's fortune in the empty bathhouse is frightening,' said an old maid who lived with the Melyukovs during supper. "'Why?' said the eldest Melyukov girl. "'Oh, you wouldn't go. It takes courage.' "'I'll go,' said Sonia. "'Tell what happened to the young lady,' said the second Melyukov girl. Well, began the old maid, a young lady once went out, took a cock, laid the table for two all properly, and sat down. 
After sitting a while, she suddenly hears someone coming. A sleigh drives up with harness bells. She hears him coming. He comes in, just in the shape of a man, like an officer, comes in and sits down to table with her. <laughs> Screamed Natasha, rolling her eyes in horror. Yes, and how did he speak? Yes, like a man. Everything quite all right, he began persuading her, and she should have just kept him talking till cockcrow, but she got frightened, just got frightened, and hid her face in her hands, and then he caught her up. It was lucky the maids ran in then. Now why frighten them, said Pelagaya Danilovna. Mummy, you used to try fate yourself, said her daughter. And how does one do it in a barn, required Sonia. Well, say you went into the barn now and listen. It depends on what you hear. Hammering or knocking, that's bad, but a sound of shifting grain is good, and sometimes one hears that too. Mama, tell us what happened to you in the barn. Pelagaya Danilovna smiled. Oh, I've forgotten, she replied, but none of you go would go. Yes, I will, Pelagaya Danilovna. Let me. I'll go, said Sonia. Well, why not, if you're not afraid? Louisa Ivanovna, may I? asked Sonia. Whether they were playing the ring and string game, or the rouble game, or talking as now, Nicholas did not leave Sonia's side, and gazed at her with quiet new eyes. It seemed to him that it was only to-day, thanks to that burnt cork moustache, that he had fully learnt to know her, and really that evening Sonia was brighter, more animated and prettier than Nicholas had ever seen her before. "'I'm not afraid of anything,' said Sonia. "'May I go at once?' she got up. They told her where the barn was, and how she should stand and listen, and they handed her a fur cloak. She threw this over her head and shoulders and glanced at Nicholas. How darling that girl is, he thought, and what have I been thinking of till now? Sonia went out into the passage to go to the barn. Nicholas went hastily to the front porch, saying he felt too hot. The crowd of people really had made the house stuffy. Outside there was the same cold stillness and the same moon, but even brighter than before. The light was so strong, and the snow sparkled, and so many stars that one did not wish to look up at the sky, and the real stars were unnoticed. The sky was black and dreary, while the earth was gay. "'I'm a fool, a fool. What have I been waiting for?' thought Nicholas, and running out from the porch he went around the corner of the house and along the path that led to the back porch. He knew Sonia would pass that way. Halfway lay some snow-covered piles of firewood, and across and along them a network of shadows from the bare old lime trees fell on the snow and on the path. This path led to the barn. The log walls of the barn and its snow-covered roof that looked as if hewn out of some precious stone sparkled in the moonlight. A tree in the garden snapped with the frost, and then all was again perfectly silent. His bosom seemed to inhale not air, but the strength of eternal youth and gladness. From the back porch came the sound of feet descending the steps. The bottom step, upon which snow had fallen, gave a ringing creak, and he heard the voice of an old maid service saying, Straight, straight along the path, miss, only don't look back. I'm not afraid, answered Sonia's voice, and along the path towards Nicholas came the crunching, whistling sound of Sonia's feet in her thin shoes. Sonia came along, wrapped in her cloak. She was only a couple of paces away when she saw him, and to her, too, he was not the Nicholas she had known, and always slightly feared. He was in a woman's dress with tousled hair, and a happy smile new to Sonia. She ran rapidly towards him. Quite different and yet the same, thought Nicholas, looking at her face, all lit up by the moonlight. He slipped his arms under the cloak that had covered her head, embraced her, pressed her to him, and kissed her on the lips that wore a moustache and had a smell of burnt cork. 
Sonia kissed him full on the lips, and disengaging her little hands, pressed them to his cheeks. Sonia, Nicholas, was all that they said. They ran to the barn and then back again, re-entering he by the front and she by the back porch. End of chapter 11